we're looking at 200 to 2,000 and more parts per million coming off from this patient. Wow. Highest concentration initially when they're brought in, and that's when the nurses have to be the most engaged. Welcome to PACU Nursing Minutes. Today, I have a very important topic to share with you, and that is the waste of anesthesia gases in the PACU. Thank you, Dr. McLaughlin, for collaborating with me to share with my fellow PACU nurses uh, the concern of WAG in the post-anesthesia care unit. And I also would like to thank you for being the first guest on PACU Nursing Minutes. I recently learned about this occupational hazard at the National ASPAN Conference last week, where Dr. McLaughlin and Dr. Applegate presented on WAG. Dr. James D. McLaughlin is a faculty scholar and professor emeritus of health sciences at Purdue University. Before becoming a professor at Purdue University, he was a commissioned officer in the US Public Health Service and senior researcher performing exposure assessments of health hazards and the design of engineering controls with the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, a center under the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. He has been the primary researcher investigator of WAG and effectiveness of scavenging systems for more than 40 years. We both have no disclosures. Now, let's jump right in. Dr. McLaughlin, what is WAG? Thank you, Kathy, for your very kind introduction. Uh, waste anesthetic gases are small amounts of volatile anesthetic gases that leak from the patient's anesthetic breathing circuit. This can be from the tanks, it can be from the feed lines, it can be breathing bags and so on, uh, during the delivery of anesthesia into the air of operating rooms. Nurses and other healthcare personnel are exposed to WAGs during these operations. Also, waste anesthetic gases, commonly called WAGs, can be exhaled in significant concentrations from patients in the post-anesthesia care unit and into the air of these rooms. The PACU uh, contains a number of patients and a number of nurses that have to work in close proximity to these patients, which is where the exposure occurs. These gases may be exhaled by the patients recovering from anesthesia, where the highest concentrations are usually at the very beginning when they're brought into uh, the post-anesthesia care unit. Gases include both nitrous oxide and halogenated anesthetics, including halothane, ethrane, isoflurane, disflurane. Sevoflurane is commonly used, and many of you uh, are very familiar with this. It's a sweet smelling mm -hmm. uh, gas, it's non-flammable. It's highly uh, fluorinated uh, methyl isopropyl ether used as an inhalational anesthetic for induction and maintenance of anesthesia. And it's extremely volatile, uh, great for anesthesia, but also because of its volatility, it mm -hmm. tends to off gas very easily uh, from the patient. Yes, I, I've recalled many patients that I've recovered and I'm holding their airway and I'm about as close to my computer as I am to their, their airway, and I can smell the SIVO. And that is a problem that we are addressing today. Why should PACU nurses care about WAG? Are there short-term and long-term health effects? Yes, first, you have to understand that there is a uh, recommended exposure limit to uh, waste anesthetic gases. And that's covered in the, in the literature. And we've known about these health effects really since the 1960s. Uh, and it seems that every five years or so, there's a, a uh, renewed interest in waste anesthetic gases, especially when an epidemiologic study comes out or an exposure assessment study comes out and says, we have a problem. So typically when you look at operating rooms, for example, uh, mm -hmm. you're gonna see much higher concentrations uh, initially because it's administered in percentage as an anesthetic uh, in terms of concentration that we're concerned about, it's in parts per million. So mm -hmm. we're looking at a much, much smaller concentration with a very toxic effect. So to the patient, it's fine, but for chronic exposure over time, it becomes a problem. So in this case, with healthcare providers, particularly the anesthesia professionals such as yourself and the nurses, 
uh, especially those in the PACU exposed to, to WAGs, they have adverse health effects, uh, in, including a, a number of different things such as uh, nausea, uh, dizziness, headaches, fatigue, irritability. Uh, and then the long-term uh, implications are sterility, miscarriages, wow. birth defects, cancer, and liver and kidney disease. And this has all been proven epidemiologically that these, these are problems. So you have the short-term effects, as mm -hmm. I mentioned a little bit earlier, that you probably feel and you say, well, maybe this is maybe associated with my work or length of day or maybe my caseload for the day. But no, this can be from exposure uh, to the waste anesthetic gases. But the long-term implications are even much more severe, especially when you look at this uh, as a teratogen basically passed on uh, to your unborn child as being a problem. And it happens both in males as well as uh, females. Wow. I've been working in the PACU for the last um, five years and I was completely unaware that, you know, I was having this potential hazard to my health. And like you said, um, you know, the fatigue, the headache, you know, you just attribute that to your 10 or 12 hour shift. Um, but it could be, you know, maybe you're on your eighth or ninth patient and you've just been, you know, cumulatively exposed to this occupational hazard of the waste anesthesia gas. So is there help coming um, to contain WAG in the PACU? I'd love to say the cavalry is at the door, uh, but it has been a, a long slog. Think about this. Mm -hmm. We've known about these hazards. Uh, the health hazards, both the, the acute and the, and the chronic aspects since the 1960s. Uh, but one of the interesting things uh, about what's happening in the PACU is that it's a paradigm shift in thinking that exposures typically come from sources such as the tanks and so on where the gases are stored or in failures of the delivery systems where they might leak or become fatigued. Uh, okay. But when you think about the patient being a source, then you really, you have to scratch your head a little bit and you say, well, is that really a significant problem? And this is really a key take home for anyone looking your Zoom meeting. And that is that when the patient is first brought into the PACU, that's when the concentrations are the highest from the patient off-gassing. And, and we talked about two parts per million for SIBO, for example, if it's in combination with the other halogenated compounds or even nitrous oxide, it's 0.5. We're looking at 200 to 2,000 and more parts per million coming off from this patient. Wow. Highest concentration initially when they're brought in, and that's when the nurses have to be the most engaged, right, with yep. that particular patient uh, to to bring them to full consciousness. So it's 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 a perfect storm for a bad thing uh, happening in the PACU, uh, and it was only really recently discovered within the last 10 years or so that patients are a significant source of exposure uh, to waste anesthetic gases. So with that said, to answer your question is that there's really a, a, a building body of evidence uh, and there are a number of references out there. I think you're going to include that uh, in this particular discussion in the peer reviewed literature that's helping us raise awareness uh, in the healthcare community about WAG exposure in particular uh, from patients in the PACU. Uh, and it's persistent and it's pervasive and it can accumulate over time if you don't have the proper number of air changes in that room mm. or some kind of source control in order to reduce those exposures. That's one thing. So um, there are a number of examples of this uh, that uh, we, can, we can talk about in terms of the uh, patient off-gassing and there's a source control uh, that uh, is market available uh, that you can see in this particular instance. Dr. McLaughlin, can you share with me a little more about um, the scavenging systems to help control the source? First, I'd like to talk about um, uh, seeing is believing uh, in, in terms of looking at the patient off-gassing, the, 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 we're called outgassing, the waste anesthetic gas in the PACU. So this is courtesy of Dr. Manning. And just to show this video, this shows a patient just uh, brought out of surgery. Uh, mm -hmm. She is uh, comfortably resting. She has a mask on. This is a source control right here. It's, it's hooked up to a vacuum system. And what I, I uh, 
this particular video shows is you show the close interaction of the nurse to the mm -hmm. patient so the patient doesn't scratch themselves or hurt themselves while they're being brought into full consciousness right here holding on but look at they're within six to eight inches of the breathing zone of that patient and here we take the mask off just to demonstrate that the patient is off gassing the waste anesthetic gas that you can see here uh, and when you don't have use source controls you can imagine not imagine, but you experience yourself getting right within that breathing zone of that patient mm -hmm. and taking in any of that waste anesthetic gas that comes off. I might also add uh, that later, uh, a, a twofer in terms of source control is our recent experience with SARS-CoV-2, uh, the disease that causes uh, uh, COVID-19. It can also be used as an opportunity to control uh, for pathogens, uh, you know, be they COVID-19 uh, or be they tuberculosis uh, or any respiratory hazard that may be coming from a patient. I fully agree. Um, one could even make the argument that um, the scavenging systems would be a part of PPE for the PACU nurses. The, you know, personal protective equipment uh, against this occupational hazard and then the occupational pathogens. Um, so thank you for that video, Dr. McLaughlin. That was very profound, being able to see the, the off-gassing. Where should the PACU nurses begin to advocate for um, source control in their PACU? Great question, Kathy. First, I think they need, the nurses need to organize and raise their voices uh, that there's a problem with WAG exposure in the PACU. As you mentioned, this was not something you were aware of until recently. Uh, okay. And this is usually brought on by associations such as the American Association of Perianesthesia Nurses uh, by having conferences, especially with content experts and so on, to be able to talk about emerging information and evidence that this is a particular problem. Um, that then the collective voice of the nurses, because let's face it, without you, work isn't going to get done. I mean, the fact you, you're, you're the earth angels uh, of the planet and uh, you're needed to do this. But if you're being exposed and there are acute hazards and there are chronic hazards, then something needs to be done. And it's one thing to raise awareness about it and say, well, we don't really have any controls other than maybe increasing the airflow, for example. And NIOSH has put out some recommendations on engineering side of things. And the operating rooms are much higher uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the number of air changes in that volume of space, uh, as well as fresh air being brought in. But when you look at the PACU, it's half that amount. And it's really based on dated information about not knowing that the patients are a significant source uh, of exposure. So that's one thing. Uh, but really, from that point of raising your voices, going through organizations such as ASPAN, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and then using ASPAN to write to authorities such as NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, which as you mentioned is under the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, under Health and Human Services, they are not a regulatory body. They are a research body that can make recommendations to regulatory bodies such as OSHA. Okay. So there are no standards right now, mm -hmm. but if there's enough of an issue that occurs and it comes from an authority such as uh, the CDC, NIOSH, then there's enough incentive by the industry to incorporate market available controls, which you just saw uh, in the, the previous video is that there's a, a great source control. And this works a lot better than relying on, on ventilation or fresh air changes and so on. Why? Because of the close proximity between yourself uh, and the patient and the, uh, the amount of wag coming off from that patient initially when they're brought in where you are basically by the nature of your job have to be in close proximity, especially when the concentrations are at their highest. So it's really, it's a one, two, three thing. Number one, mm -hmm. raise your voices collectively going through an organization such as ASPAN, that mm -hmm. organization then going through a government entity, that government entity making a strong recommendation that this should be done, having a market available tool, such as the scavenging system that you saw available Mm -hmm. And then coming back and putting pressure on those healthcare administrators to implement these controls. And by the way, you say that um, the cost effectiveness of this particular control, when you mm -hmm. look at ways in which you're going to reduce all the acute effects of exposure, 
uh, where you may also be able to reduce absenteeism, reduce lethargy, uh, tiredness, and so on and so forth, pays you back dividends down the road, especially when you look at the potential of removing all the potential chronic issues that I outlined earlier in the presentation. That's your winning combination. Absolutely. And just to elaborate a little bit more, how much um, control does the scavenging system give um, it, you know, in controlling the anesthesia gas? Are you able to elaborate a little bit more on how much of a source control, if one of these scavenging systems was implemented, what would it give to the department? That's a, that's a great question because it's, uh, because it's source control. Uh, you have to look at, at your options. You know, if you look at ventilation, then you're basically diluting, uh, you know, the, 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 the waste anesthetic gas, but you may not be diluting it in the immediate area between the patient and the nurse. Mm -hmm. So you're not doing really anything other than bringing it down just a little bit. And maybe over the course of the day, those concentrations are going to start creeping up, but it won't creep up as much with the high air changes and the fresh air coming in. But with source control, you can literally nip it in the bud with, with near 100% control. The only difference would be if someone sneezes or coughs and there's some you know, of the gas that may escape around the framework of the particular mask, but it's nearly complete because remember, this is under a vacuum system. The vacuum system usually runs at about 45 liters a minute, which really puts everything under negative pressure. Okay. It's a safe mask too, because 10 liters of oxygen is going through the nasal cannula to make sure that the patient is safe. So uh, by doing that, you know, if you're saying 98% control versus a dilution control, such as um, general ventilation, you're always going to go for that source control. And as I mentioned, you get two things out of this. One, you've got WAG control mm -hmm. significantly because you're bringing that patient in right at the very beginning where the concentrations are highest. And also you have the potential to control for pathogens. In this day and age with SARS-CoV-2, it is profound to be able to do pathogen control. Thank you for elaborating a little bit more on the scavenging system and the benefits of it. Thanks for asking. In closing, thank you, Dr. McLaughlin, for your time and expertise in raising awareness of WAG and its health implications in the PACU. We deeply appreciate all your work that you have done over the years to bring attention and identifying resolutions through scavenging systems and filters to halt the occupational health hazard of WAG in the PACU. I would also like to thank ASPAN for their laser focus this past year to bring this occupational hazard to the forefront. For additional references, please see the show notes below. And thank you for tuning in to PACU Nursing Minutes. I'm Nurse Kathy. Happy National Nurses Week. Thank you, Dr. McLaughlin. My pleasure. Thank you very much and Godspeed to all of you.